What happens when one man tries to watch all the horror films of the 1980s? Well, we're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel. This is The 80s Project. So this is where this year starts getting interesting because we're all the way into October now, but there's still a lot more left to do with 1982. In fact, this entire episode is devoted to films that came out in the month of October, although a couple don't have set dates. But what's crazy is that the entire next episode is mostly October releases as well, and that's, that's likely due to Halloween. And hey, speaking of Halloween, well... Wait until the ending of this episode. We'll start this one off on October 8th, even though it did screen in Colombia back in May for a little something that is called Murder by Phone. It begins with a woman in the subway and she picks up a random ringing payphone to very deadly results. And like, who answers payphones anyway? It's not gonna be for you. Alan Quatermain is here as a science teacher, and the woman killed in the intro was one of his neighbor's daughters, so he promises to try to find out what happened to her. And another person is phone blasted. The great John Houseman is on hands, and, and I don't know why this struck me as insane, but Nat is told that the young girl's death was witnessed by a homeless woman, and he goes back to the scene of the telephone, and it's a completely empty station. But there's one person there at the exact time that he is. And it just so happens to be that same exact homeless woman. Like, whenever someone is killed by the phone, there, there's a man's voice beforehand. And it's very clear that they're targeting specific people. And Nat teams up with an employee of the telephone company. And they have to try to push through red tape and cover-ups to figure out what's going on. And for a film that's under the radar as this one is, it has a prestigious director. This is by Michael Anderson, who had been directing since the 50s and did the classic Around the World in 80 Days, and also made Logan's Run and one of my favorites, Orca. It was based on a novel called Phone Call, written by Michael Butler and Dennis Shriak, and they also did the script for the film. There's not a credit saying it's based on a novel in the film, although reprints of the book would play up the link. One of its minor claims to fame is that the music is by John Barry, the five times Oscar winning composer who would go on to do a large number of prestigious films, including Dances with Wolves, Chaplin, and his most important credit, the conductor for the music for Howard the Duck. His reputation was built around orchestrated scores and being a conductor, uh, which is why this film is unusual since it's a fully electronic, synthesized score and is one of the very few that he did that way. There's also apparently a version of this that ran in the UK under the title Bells that was a full 20 minutes longer. And this was surprisingly fun. I give it 3 out of 5 tapes here. There's hints of a much better story going on, so I think it could have been higher up. But what is here is still a good time. Its significance is just a 1.5 though, since it's really obscure and not spoken of, but did have some names attached. Should you watch it? Yeah, give it a ring. I'll call you. We're staying on the 8th, but traveling all the way to Australia for the next one, although it did premiere in cons in May. But the 8th is when it got the general release, and it's Crosstalk. This has Bill and his wife here, and they're off on a cabin retreat when he tries to develop a new form of artificial intelligence called the I-500. And his wife is a bit resentful of the amount of time that he's spending with it. It's hooked up to a number of his household appliances, but seems to be pretty glitchy. And it's even in his car. And one day, he's in a wreck. He's then wheelchair bound and given a time limit on how much longer he has to finish the project. He's put up in a penthouse and given a nurse to watch over him and a number of video cameras to survey the property. Right away, he notices one of the other couples that live there seem to be having issues, and the machines there seem to be trying to kill him. The weird glitches keep happening, and when Bill starts to think that his neighbor killed his wife, he's on the case. And hey, 
That sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? A man in a wheelchair, confined to an apartment, thinks his neighbor killed his wife and enlists a younger woman to help him investigate. And yes, this is a deliberate take on Rear Window. And this, the story behind this one is possibly more full of twists than the film itself. A filmmaker named Keith Salvat wrote a script called High Rise that was his take on the Hitchcock classic, and he received funding to develop the concept further from producer Ross Matthews. He brought on a co-producer named Errol Sullivan since he himself was wrapped up with another project, and Sullivan and Salvat didn't get along at all. After a tense 19 days on set, Salvat was eventually fired and replaced by the first AD, Mark Edgerton. Most of his career before this was as a first AD, and he worked on some pretty big pictures, including Picnic and Hanging Rock. Although after this, he would direct only one more picture before going back into the AD role, landing in Hollywood and doing things like Species, Underworld, and The Saint. Anyway, when he got promoted here, they did a full rewrite on the script, and only one or two of the scenes that Salva shot ended up in the picture, so he requested his name be taken off the film and that they change the title. His version was called Wall to Wall, so they replaced that with Crosstalk. It, it didn't really get much attention, and the behind-the-scenes drama was talked about more than the film itself, and it didn't really make a splash at the box office either, only, only 26000 in Australia. And this was decent, but just not that great, so it's a two for me. It's dull at times, and the best bits are the stuff that feels like Rear Window, but to be honest, I'd rather just watch Rear Window. Its HCS is just a 1 since no one has heard of this and it's remarkably obscure. Should you watch it, stick with Jimmy Stewart instead, or, or even Christopher Reeve. <laughs> this next one is one of those that doesn't have a confirmed release date, but we do know that it had a run in 82, and it's The Icebox Murders, otherwise known as El Cepo. We begin with a young woman being chased and then strangled, and it seems as if there's a string of disappearances of young women in France. There's Chantal here, and she's a prostitute, and one of her clients is an older blind man that wants her to quit the job and just be with him. He pays her and her friend to come away with him for two weeks if they load up on a train and head out to his stately manor out in the middle of the countryside. The Doc is played by Jack Taylor, who we just saw an episode or so back in Pieces, and in this same year also showed up in Conan. He gives them a tour of the grounds and tells them that it's surrounded by boar traps, so they have to watch their step. And Jean is the creepy caretaker there. And then it's just this sort of slow burn, and the women try to sneak out and live their lives while the Doc tries to control them. And all the while, everyone is really curious about what's in that big old icebox in the basement. And this one is from Spain, even though it's primarily shot in France, and it's from Francisco Rodriguez Gordillo, and it was only one of two films that he would direct. The other one didn't arrive for 15 years, and was 1997's Lycanthropus, The Moonlight Murders, one of the final Paul Nashie werewolf films. Contrary to the insinuation of the title and the surreal poster art, this isn't really a standard slasher and instead it's a low-key drama with these women in the villa and their tense relationship with their client and his servant. The Spanish title of El Cepo actually translates to The Stocks, uh, which refers instead to the bear trap, or in this case, boar trap, that they show on the box art, although it's a pretty minor aspect of the film and is never actually seen in use. Mogul, the video company that released it in the US, changed the title to The Icebox Murders, and even that isn't even a major plot point. It's possible that they were intending to tie it into an actual murder case from Texas in 1965 that was referred to as The Icebox Murders, although the aspects of the case were very different, except for the instance of storing bodies in a big freezer. It doesn't appear to have received an American theatrical run, although it did get a VHS release. And this one's not great. I'm just going to go with a two here. It's like dreadfully slow. And, and I think it's meant to be a mystery, but it's painfully obvious what's going on the whole time. Its significance is another one, since it, again, is extremely obscure and doesn't really feature much in the way of known faces. Should you watch it? 
nah, just leave this one on ice. <laughs> Moving further into October now, and our next entry came out on the 12th, but did have a premiere previously in March. And it's Deadly Games. We have what appears to be a sort of a horror-geared candy land, which I kind of want to play. And, and then a young woman named Linda is attacked by a masked man in her house. And he pushes her out a window to her death. Her sister is informed of her passing, and Sam Groom is here. And coincidentally, we'll see him a little later this year in yet another movie with Deadly in the title. There's a little local diner that's run by Dick Butkus, who I most know for playing the character of uh, Dick Butkus, um, where Keegan runs into a bunch of people she used to know from back in high school. And Steve Railsback is here as well. And how the hell is this his first appearance on the project? I know that this is still kind of early in his career and all, but I really thought he'd be in like every other movie. Billy and Roger work together, and, and they're playing that board game from the intro. And there's a short appearance by Maureen Robinson. And Yvette the French Maid is here as well. Billy was in Nam and was pretty messed up there. And Keegan low-key gets the scoop on everyone around in order to try to figure out what happened to her sister. Meanwhile, that mysterious guy is still playing that game. And look, find Harlot at pub, gain one victim. I, re I really want this game. That night, Randy is killed by the masked man, and Keegan tries to navigate a flirtation with Roger while surviving, and they go see a scary movie. And hey, look, it's The Monster Walks, which I just covered not that long ago in the 30s project. And hey, speaking of movie theaters, here's a weird little tidbit. Remember back in the 1980 project episodes when I covered a movie called The Attic? That was about a woman struggling to break free from her tyrannical father and at one point goes to a movie theater and meets a man. Well, the movie that they're watching in that one, in 1980, is this film. And that's because this one was shot in 1980 and then for whatever reason sat on a shelf for a couple of years before being released. And this was the directorial debut of Scott Mansfield. He wrote this as well, but it's his only horror feature and in fact, his filmography after this is pretty scattered with large gaps in between projects. And it looks like it may have actually premiered on Showtime first in the spring. And it looks like most of its run were smaller theaters and drive-ins and didn't really do solid business. And I'm going to give this one a two and a half. There's uh, some interesting stuff going on, but it's really hard to peg down what their plan is with this movie. It seems to wander around and not know what it wants to be. For a rather large portion of it. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a 1.5 for significance though since it's pretty unheard of. This is not a very well-known movie and doesn't really feature much in the way of known stars, although I'll give it the 0.5 for the appearance of Railsback. Should you watch it? Uh, I mean it's worth a watch. It's okay. I would not call this one a great movie, but it's a game that's kind of worth playing. We're headed back to Australia, and we're now just ahead two days since on October 14th there was the release of Turkey Shoot. We get some news footage of riots and chaos in the opening, and it's in a sort of dystopian future. And Bill Denborough's wife is here, and she's being sent off to a prison camp for objecting to police brutality. And then there's, hey, look, it's Steve Rails back. Maybe he will be in every other movie or every movie from here on. Their group, including Rita, who they accuse of being a prostitute, are taken to the camp where Fifi is one of the guards. They're extremely abusive there, and I guess I should point out that several of these people are hugely popular in Australian TV. Take Linda Stoner, who plays Rita, for example, and she hasn't been in many films or shows that we know, but she's a major player in TV down under. Our main baddie is played by Michael Craig, another long-running Aussie actor, but oddly enough was nominated for an Oscar back in 1961, but for writing. It turns out that the camp is big on games, although they're just basically cruelty. And oh yeah, they also have this werewolf guy that they say that they found at a circus. They pull together our main group and make them an offer. 
They'll let them out with a head start, but they're going to be hunted down in what they call the turkey shoot. They have 12 hours to survive as they're hunted by people with weaponry, and if they survive, they will be set free. And yep, this is a take on the most dangerous game, the story from 1924. And this was an early film from director Brian Trenchard Smith. Smith would go on to do a large number of awesome flicks, and right after this one would also do BMX Bandits, but then also Dead End Drive-In, and much later on, Leprechaun 3 and 4. He seems to be retired now, though, as his last film was back in 2014. It was said to be a rather troubled shoot all around, like, like the budget was meant to be more than 3 million Australian, but an investor backed out at the last minute, reducing their funds by around 700,000, forcing them to reduce the schedule from 44 days down to 28, causing them to rush. There was also cast issues, as Linda Stoner took great offense to a scene in which she was meant to cut open a fish, causing the effects crew to slap together a fake one, although in the finished cut, you can't even really see anything. Then she refused to do a nude scene in the showers, and her and Smith came to a compromise of a butt shot, which she later regretted. Olivia Hussey also didn't want to do a nude moment and requested a body double, and they agreed to that, although the actress later stated that she wished that she had done the nudity, as she felt that the double's body wasn't as nice as hers. The reviews were horrible, with critics calling it unfit for human consumption and saying it was trash. And it ended up being a bomb in Australia. And when it was released in the US, it was in a drastically chopped down version that was titled Escape 2000 and fared just as poorly. Thankfully, when it was given a UK release, it did extremely well and recouped most of its budget and has since gone on to a minor cult notoriety. It also got a remake in 2014, also called Turkey Shoot, that eliminated the campier aspects of the movie and went with a more serious tone. And this is a three from me. It's pretty cool, uh, like a, a bit underdeveloped, but still a nice watch. It's HCS is a two since it's lesser known, although, although it has a bit of a cult notice and has rails back and Hussey and Smith's involvement. Should you watch it? Sure, gobble this one up. Just one day later, back in the States, on October 15th, there was another entry in the slasher genre with Unhinged. We meet a trio of young women, and they're on their way to a music festival, and on a road trip, of course. Unfortunately, there's a big rainstorm, and they get into a car crash. And when Terry wakes up, she's in the house of Marion and Norman here. They tell her that her friends are pretty banged up, but they don't have a phone, and the storm washed out the roads, so they're stuck here for a bit. They have an older woman who is wheelchair-bound and is their mother, and they all have dinner. And Mom is pretty cranky. Later on, someone is peeking in the window. Things get weirder when they find a tooth in their bed, so they decide to get out of there. But first, a shower. Turns out that there is a killer on the loose out there with sigh in hand, but is the danger outside or in the house. And this was all shot in the Portland area, directed by Don Gronquist, who had a pretty limited run in the film world. This was his first film as a director, but he had previously written and produced a crime drama called Stark Raven Mad. And it wouldn't be until 1995 that he would direct another film, a war thriller called The Devil's Keep, which would be his final work. He also wrote the script for this one, which has been described as one part Texas Chainsaw and several parts Psychos, maybe a touch of Sleepaway Camp. One minor note is that the entire cast and crew were native to the Portland area, and one of them was Gus Van Sant, who was living there at the time. He served as the location scout for a portion of the shooting. It was shot on a pretty low budget of 100000 and mostly done at the historic Pittock Mansion during the evening hours when it was closed to tourists. It seems like there's some dispute about the release date since IMDb shows its release in October of 1982, but Wikipedia claims that it first screened at Cannes in May of 83, and then was released in the UK shortly afterwards, and didn't screen in the US until August of 83. Its UK release was controversial since they popped it on the video nasty list, and it was seized and confiscated. It did eventually get released there on video, 
in late 83, though with an 18 certificate. The write-ups were not strong, and most criticized the acting and the pace, but it did get some accolades for the atmosphere and look of the film, as well as the score and themes, and has since developed a minor cult following. In fact, there was a remake in England in 2017, and a second remake has been announced, this one from the director of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. And now I'm with 2.5 on this one. It's got a good mood going, and I like some of what they're doing, but just not enough happens here, and it winds up being a little too slow. Its significance is a 1.5, since it's not really that known or spoken of, and doesn't have too much in the way of horror actors, but it was on the nasty list. Should you watch it? Maybe. maybe. Not a bad watch, but maybe just a little too much of things you've seen elsewhere. One day later, on October 16th, we're taking a trip onto the small screen for a TV movie called Hotline. We start at what I, I think may be the, the Point Doom in, in Malibu, where, where the ending of Planet of the Apes take place. Although, uh, although I may be wrong, because it looks the same, but also kind of different. So I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm wrong. A man disposes of a body here, and then Diana Prince is here. And she's a bartender, and one of her customers gets pretty belligerent with her. And holy crap, she's a bartender in a dive bar and yet has this pimp-ass car? That night, someone is lurking in her house and another man shows up and says he's scared him off, but he's a bit creepy himself. He invites her to do volunteer work for his company that runs a hotline for helping people with their domestic problems. She takes him up on it and also still works at the bar, still fending off advances of the clients, and she works with this guy. And I have to say, he's not familiar to me, but I looked him up and he's from Days of Our Lives. And when I say that he's from Days of Our Lives, I mean that he's been on 2,773 episodes of it from 1981 to 2024. That's 65 episodes a year. She gets a call from someone admitting to some recent murders and calls himself the Barber claims to be responsible for several murders from London to New York. And he keeps giving her these big elaborate rhyming clues to his previous killings. And I'm sorry, did these guys not realize that this is Wonder Woman and the Riddler is not in her rogues gallery? And this one was aired in CBS and was shot under the title Reach Out and was directed by Jerry Jameson, another guy whose entire film list has the words TV movie next to the names. Although he did a few theatrical features, including Airport 77. He'd been in the industry since the 60s and worked extensively in the editing department before making the change to directing. And he's still around, although at 90 years old, he's now retired. It's pretty low in the actual killing since it's made for TV, although there is a death by harpoon gun. And even though it was obvious that they were evoking that slasher vibe, they didn't really have the room to live up to it. And I give this one a three. It, it's better than your average TV movie, but it, but it manages some good mood and an actual mystery that keeps you guessing, but it's still a bit sluggish and restrained by the limitations of TV. Its significance is a 1.5 since it's another that's relatively unknown, but features a couple of recognizable faces. Should you watch it? I'd say, yeah. I mean, you get to watch Linda Carter, so why not? For what it is, this is a beautiful piece of equipment. We're now heading into the ending of October as we go now to the 22nd for a film that was from the UK, and it's The Sender. We have this young man waking up on the side of the road and then wandering to a nearby beach where he puts rocks in his coat and walks into the lake. He survives and is taken to a nearby institution where he's assigned to Dr. Farmer, and he claims that he has never had a father and suffers from amnesia. He meets some of the other inmates, including Apone, who warns him of the assholes and the elbows, and a man known only as the Messiah. They take to calling the kid John Doe, and that night, Gail sees John break into her house and take a small necklace. Except, 
that her windows aren't broken, and John is still back at the Institute asleep, and the necklace is still there. Farmer butts heads with fellow Dr. Belloc, who is a proponent of shock treatment, and she continues to be plagued with odd dreamlike images and hallucinations that seem to be pointing her towards John Doe's past. She realizes that John is telepathic but has no control over it, and it's how his subconscious communicates and tries to get through to him. And pretty soon, his powers are leaking out and affecting everyone around with some pretty dark consequences. And this one is from Roger Christian, who handled the directing, and this man has an Oscar for art direction on Star Wars. And he was also nominated for another for the same gig on Alien. This would mark his feature debut, although his directing career would never quite reach the levels that his art direction did. But he is pretty notorious in one sense. He's the director of what is considered one of the worst films of all time, Battlefield Earth. This one had started at 20th Century Fox, and they wanted to sort of piggyback off the success of De Palma's The Fury, but some pre-production issues caused them to drop it. But Paramount picked the script up. It seemed that they were looking to expand their horror horizons after their Friday the 13th success, and this seemed like a different direction. Christian was then chosen to direct, although he wanted to make something less like a slasher film and more of a psychological horror. There were some battles with the studio after they thought the initial cuts were too slow, and they wanted to put the ending of the film onto the beginning in order to get to the action faster, and then have the story be told in flashback. But Paramount wasn't impressed, and after a test screen went poorly, they pushed the film into a limited release, where it only pulled in a little over a million dollars, far less than its $8 million budget. It did better internationally, though, and its reputation increased over time, and has been called an inspiration to the Nightmare on Elm Street series. And this is another one that I'm giving a 3 to, and this is pretty good. I, I can see where it's getting the modern love from, but I just think it's way too long and spends too much time figuring out what it wants to do. Its significance is a 2.5 since it's a little more known, but is still on the lesser seen side of things and has some names, but none of that really set it apart. Should you watch it? Yes, definitely. Send it to your screen. Boy, pony, pony. Tony! This block ends on that same day, October 22nd, with perhaps the most famous and also infamous movie here, and it's Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Instead of being in Haddonfield, Illinois, we're in Northern California the week before the holiday, and this guy is attacked by guys in suits. And a news report tells us that a piece of Stonehenge is missing, and then we hear it. Yep, one of the most memorable bits of this movie, and good luck getting that song out of your head now. Anyway, that guy from the beginning is holding some sort of mask and taken to a hospital. Meanwhile, the coolest man in the goddamn world is here, and he's divorced, and has two kids, and is a doctor. He's called in to check out our mystery man, who is then horribly murdered by yet another guy in a suit, who then kills himself. The man's daughter shows up, and it's Ellie here, and the two pair up to solve the mystery of what happened. Their quest sends them to the town of Santa Mira, home of Silver Shamrock, a Halloween mask company out in the countryside. And there's a voice cameo by Laurie Strode. It's 6 o'clock. Curfew. Curfew. All residents of Santa Mira. And while checking things out, Chalice and Ellie have a fling. How old are you? Doc, you're supposed to ask that before you have sex with someone. When one of the masks laser blasts someone, bugs crawl out of them, and we meet the head of Silver Shamrock, who is also the head of OCP. And the Doc and his new gal pal have to get to the bottom of what's going on. Now, most people who don't have a ton of knowledge of the Halloween series might be confused by this point and say, but where's Michael Myers? And the answer is that he's dead. Or, well, he was meant to be. You see, after the character was fairly definitively killed off at the ending of Halloween 2, John Carpenter considered him well and truly gone. 
The idea then was to continue the Halloween franchise by making it an anthology series, and that every film would simply share the link of taking place on Halloween. The producers liked this concept since it meant that they could have a new film each year, although Carpenter himself wouldn't direct or be involved at all, outside of taking a producing role. The original concept was pretty low-key and more psychological, but Dino De Laurentiis, who was the distributor, demanded more violence and gore. Originally, Joe Dante was slated to direct, but he quit a mere couple of weeks before they started shooting as he wanted to do a segment of the Twilight Zone movie instead. Carpenter then gave the gig to Tommy Lee Wallace, who had been the art director for the first film, and even though he said no to directing Halloween 2, he came on board here. It had a budget of $4.6 million, a rather big increase from Halloween 2's $2.5 million, showing that there was a good deal of hope put into this concept paying off. Unfortunately, things did not go as planned. It got mostly negative reviews from mainstream critics to horror magazines alike. Most criticized the plot and the nihilism, but for a lot of the more Halloween-oriented viewers, the main critique was always the same. Where was Michael Myers? It still managed to scare up $14 million at the box office, which was a nice profit, but it was nowhere near the first film's $70 million, or even Part 2's $25. It was generally viewed as a disappointment and derailed the entire plan to continue the anthology concept, and the series took a long break before finally bringing old ghost Shatner back in 1988 with Halloween 4 The Return of Michael Myers. One quick note is there was a novelization of the film that was released at the same time, and it contained a few mild variations. For one, Connell Cochran is hinted to survive the ending through the magic of the Stonehenge rock. And for the other, the ending is far more decisive. In the film, things are left up in the air, with a cliffhanger-style ending that could either end with everyone safe or thousands upon thousands of children dying. In the novel, however, it is made perfectly clear that things go sour and Silver Shamrock completes their joke. Their joke on the children. And yeah, I don't care what anyone says. I love this one. It's a four from me and it's a great film. But sure, it's a bit unfocused at times. I, I almost wish that the anthology idea had taken off and we had all these different sorts of Halloween tales from each year. Its significance is also a four since it's an entry in one of the biggest IPs in horror, even though it's a frequently derided one. But it also has Atkins, which gets any film some extra points, and was the start of Wallace's directing career. Should you watch it? 100%. Just don't expect to see a certain jumpsuit slasher. And happy Halloween. So there you have it, the beginning of October of 1982, and my favorite one from this block is very easily Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. I love it. I don't care. Uh, I know a lot of people really are down on that one because there's no Michael in it or whatever like that. I, it, I don't care. It's a fun movie on its own. It's great. Um, let me know what your favorite of this block was down below. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel to get notified when new episodes of the project go live and check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines and help keep the project going. New episodes are upcoming very, very soon because there's always more movies to watch right here on the 80s project. <laughs>